16 by Leila Kavar about legal activism and deportation resistance, um, which will be coming up uh, next month. Uh, today, we are happy to have uh, Professor Lori Dance here from the University of Nebraska. Um, and she will uh, soon explain what she's going to talk about. Uh, I just want to say that I'm circulating also this uh, main sheet here uh, for signing for uh, Don't, don't get excited. I mean, it's like... So thank you for coming. <laughs> for Hello, it's great to be here. And I'd like to thank whoever ordered up that great weather. You know, I used to live in Cambridge. And so I came, I came from Nebraska, Lincoln, Nebraska. Um, and I brought a thick wool coat, uh, jacket actually, that I didn't even need. So um, I'm impressed with the weather. So as Stellan said, what I'm going to present today is a grant proposal in progress. And if the internet co co um, cooperates later, we'll even give you a chance to look at some of the materials I tend to use when I use comedy to facilitate challenging discussions. Right? So I'm hoping that as we get to the end of the presentation, you would get to have your own immediate responses. Some of the things that I show you may have already seen, but I'm going to put you in the vantage point of sitting in the class about which we might discuss some topic um, and how might comedy be used as a springboard to useful conversations, to socially conscious conversations. As I'm going to say in a moment, to do that you have to really proceed with caution because comedy is so, con so sensitive to context, to who's watching, who's listening, laughing with or laughing at people. And so um, having done this for a while since I've been a professor, uh, I wanted to think of how would we study this. And so that's what I'm going to talk about today. But we're at the very early stages. We actually had a meeting right before this presentation about a wider project that we're trying to get going that would be cross-national. The project that I'm going to talk about today, the work in progress today, is, is, is more local. Or more domestic, I should say. So what I wanted to talk about today was a book chapter, read all about it. Um, newspaper discourses and at-risk students in Sweden. I do research in Sweden, that's how I came to know Stellan. Um, but Stellan thought it would be a better idea for me to play with, to present this proposal we're working on. Um, so that's what I'm going to do. Uh, and there's another colleague involved. She'll, be, she'll appear very briefly in this presentation. So again, I want to emphasize, this is a work in progress. Um, and we're just at that stage where you're reading what other people have said about this topic, trying to figure out what we're doing that's different, the literature review, and at the process of finalizing a research question for a project that would be largely qualitative. So for those of you who are interested in how we put together research projects, this might be very useful 
because it's again this is at the very beginning stages so I don't think I'm ready to do this um, I think there's this tendency when we have really well prepared and well read PowerPoints we have this illusion of control of as professors go and I don't have that illusion so let's see what happens so ready or not here I go so first I wanted to talk about the inspiration um, that dates as far back as high school you know I can't I had a couple of teachers that were pretty funny but I always had classmates that clowned and sometimes in bad ways but other times in really funny ways and we couldn't wait for that person to be the clown or to say something funny I mean we were captivated by the potential and in one of my classes that was Kenny Hall that was his name I'm sure Kenny wouldn't appreciate me actually dropping his name um, but as I got to college I went to Georgetown University I had to take a rocks for jocks course and it's pretty boring course but the professor he was hilarious I mean he made me care about trilobites and the mass of nut and syncline and going and with a, um, a hacksaw and chipping away and trying to find fossils. He talked about, I remember um, that he talked about Neanderthals had gone, uh, they were extinct because they didn't have death perception and they would be up in the tree and they'd reach and they hit the ground, you know. He would just add things like that to the course and this course about rocks became a course I couldn't wait to sit in, right? And then there's also Bertice Berry, she's actually um, I don't know if she's still teaching, but she once taught at Kent State University and she's a sociology professor. I think now she does like motivational speaking and stuff like that. And that's who's up on the screen. She brought comedy into her sociological courses. Her classes were packed. They had to find larger rooms to seat all the students that wanted to take her class. So I had some inspiration before I myself started doing this. Um, but I've been, I think, largely successful, and I want to understand what happens, what's going on, because just to put um, something comedic up on the screen and have people watch it doesn't necessarily end up with critical thinking, and I'll talk about why that is the case. So, so how I'll proceed, I'm going to talk about this joke in progress, I'm going to go over some definitions and some philosophical perspectives. Um, I just went through the inspirations about clowning in high school, my geology professor at Georgetown University and Bertice Berry. So now I'm going to start with this broader review of literature, um, looking at stereotype, reification, context, and resistance. Those are some things that came out as important to consider in the reading what other people have done on this topic. Um, and also, I want to talk about the lessons learned. Some of them come from the literature. Some of them come from using this approach in my classes. And this would be about proceeding with great sensitivity and caution when you use comedy. As well as disentangling intent and impact. And then I want to end with this dream, like if Bill Gates, or since I'm from Nebraska, Warren Buffett would like just give us all the funding. Um, what I would continue to do what we would continue to do to design this project. And then I'd like to have time for some Q&R, questions and recommendations. I really want to hear what you think about this. You can get in on advising this project. Okay, so what I'm going from, I would like to say I'm going to go from the abstract to the more concrete, but I, I would just say I'm going to go from the abstract to the not yet concrete, but less abstract maybe. Um, so, definitions, philosophical perspectives, and inspirations. We've already done some of that. I'm going to get to the definitions and philosophical perspectives. And then um, the broader literature review. And then proceeding with caution, the lessons learned about humor and dialogue. Uh, and then this hoped for, lavishly funded project. So, so first I should say that the previous picture I took from an article by Lynn White where she talks about think about your presentation in, a, in an article as a funnel where the most abstract things are at the top and as you narrow down you point to what it is you're doing. 
And that looks really nice, but really I feel more like there's all these things twirling around, all these potential um, scholarly studies twirling around, and all I've done really is reached in and maybe pulled a few from here and a few from there. And of course, when we feel like we have control over things, we've done a much more thorough review of literatures, and I'm not there yet. So let me talk about some of the other things that pop up as I do literature, as I looked at the literature on comedy and comedy, comedy's usages. There are, of course, philosophical perspectives that I'll talk about in a moment. There is medical and health perspectives that look at um, how comedy or humor can be linked to physiological responses or psychological improvement. Unfortunately, though, a lot of that research is inconclusive or anecdotal, but it is out there. Um, and then there's this positive humor movement that borrows very um, cherry picks, really, from the medical health perspectives research, focusing on the real positive aspects, sometimes overstating correlations, which just shows that maybe laughter and improved or lower blood pressure are linked, um, but not the causal, causal direction, what's causing it. Or this positive humor movement will claim when maybe a research study has said that positive emotional state is something that's very important for health, and they'll boil that down to comedy or laughter. So the positive hu humor movement um, is something I'm looking at, but um, unfortunately a lot of the claims made by the positive humor movement haven't been supported by empirical, by rigorous empirical investigation. And then there's um, people who actually look at what I do in the classroom um, and find there's, there's some studies, they tend to be, again, qualitative, that show improved learning outcomes when you use comedy, especially when you use it for dread courses. Um, and then the literature that I focus more on was minorities and vulnerable groups and political, ethical, and critical issues. So I'm going to maybe touch each of these uh, maybe say more about uh, if we have questions about the positive humor movement, um, a lot more about minorities um, and vulnerable groups, and end with this notion of um, ethical and critical assessments. All right. So here's this joke in progress. An educator, an activist, and a sociologist walk into a bar. They sit, get their drinks, and begin to toast. The educator raises a glass and toasts to education, the great equalizer. The activist joins in and toasts to social justice. None of us are free until all of us are free. The sociologist raises the glass, frowns, and puts the glass down and says, well, I don't have a punchline yet. Well, actually, I have some punchlines that I'll show at the end of the presentation, so you got to stay to see what I came up with. Mostly I was told that my joke lacks a sense of humor, you know, and I'm, that's fine because, and I was told don't quit your day job as a professor. You may be able to use comedy in your classes, but, you know, to become a comedian, don't quit your day job, and that's fine, but, um, so what does it mean to have a sense of humor? All right, well, I used a book last year that talked about this in one of the courses I taught. My students hated it, but I'm still going to tell you these more abstract philosophical considerations. And the book was called On Humor by Simon Critchley. And then you can also find this, these claims in the Internet Encyclopedia of Humor. And so they offer these theoretical explanations. Humor is a function of incongruity, and they talk about people like Immanuel Kant and Soren Kierkegaard, primarily focusing upon the object, the object of humor. This school sees humor as a response to incongruity, a term broadly used to include ambiguity, logical impossibility, irrelevance, and inappropriateness. And then there's also humor as a function of superiority, and this would be Thomas Hobbes, Aristotle, and even Plato. And humor arises from a sudden glory when we recognize our supremacy over others. The downside of this is the people who are at the receiving end of the superiority. But humor as a desire for relief, and this is Sigmund Freud and Herbert Spencer. Um, and this is also kind of some of the, the ways in which the medical and psychological research extends itself. Um, humor as a, and psychological humor, humor as a desire for relief. 
Um, humor is a way to release or save energy generated by repression. Um, in Cracking Up, American Humor in a Time of Conflict, um, Paul Lewis extends the list of theoretical explanations to include humor, um, the ridiculing of deviations from established norms, that's one thing we see done with humor, um, the resolution of puzzling incongruities and problem solving. And then I found another definition, again, that's looking at this using humor to heal yourself or to um, be more positive. And this came from a book by Stephen Saltinoff. And he observes that though, that though a sense of humor differs among individuals and groups, there are universal characteristics governing the tendency to experience something as funny such as, and you're going to see some of the things just said. And this is good, like when you start to find um, overlap in what people are claiming, you feel like you're on to something, but they could all be wrong, but anyway, but you feel like you're on to something. So he talks about experiences such as incongruity, absurdity, ridiculousness, an unexpected future, a pleasant surprise, being startled, getting, getting it, I got it, ah. Oh. Actually, when I'm in Sweden and they tell me jokes in Swedish, I'm like... Sometimes I just don't get it. I mean, there's like a nuance in the language. And so when I get a Swedish joke, I'm really proud of myself. I'm like, I got it! Um, emotional chaos remembered in tranquility. And so according to Saltinoff, a sense of humor can be defined as the ability to perceive one or more of the universal characteristics. It involves the capacity to appreciate incongruity, absurdity, an unexpected future, a pleasant surprise, getting it. Um, I don't know that I agree with this claim that these aspects are universal. I do think laughter is, but I think I would caution us to think about how humor may display itself in different ways with different, against different cultural backdrops. Or that there may be things left off the list, like where, where is teasing? Um, and so there, I think there, but here is what some of these definitions say. And then Lockyer and Pickering, and you're going to see a different spelling of humor because they're British, they spell it the wrong way. Um, comedy involves scripted, so they distinguish between comedy and humor. Comedy involves scripted or formalized versions of comic discourse, humor spelled incorrectly in the British English. Um, as the more broader phenomenon of talk or behavior in everyday life, which is the source of or catalyst for amusement, laughter, and the joking relationship itself. And then Paul Lewis, who I spoke of a moment ago, boils it down to humor as comic amusement that can, that can but often doesn't lead to laughter. So you may be amused, although you're not laughing. Because to be amused, one need not laugh. Instead, one need only be entertained, charmed, diverted from, or alleviated of serious thought, pleased, delighted, and so on. So what I'm interested in is more this phenomenology of humor. What do I mean by that? I mean that in sculpting a grant proposal, we are more interested in the phenomenology of humor, or more specifically, where does humor intersect with critical consciousness? In more Freirean terms, under what circumstance does humor lead to a reading of the world that can make us more reflexive about social injustices? When does that happen as you are experiencing humor that you get it and you get maybe the, the satire that's raising critical consciousness in some way? Um, those of you who have watched The Daily Show may have had these types of moments where you're like, I get it. So I'm interested in that. And I'm interested in how, or we're interested in how that might be different for different people, but how it could be put to some good in terms of dialogue across differences or um, furthering social justice aims. Okay, so for example, so now you're going to get to see something and tell me if you think it's funny. Is this funny? You don't have to answer. But. We need to elect Republicans to keep our daughters safe from per pervert, pervert men wearing wigs barging into women's restrooms. And then you got Donald Trump in the Miss Teen USA dressing room. So, 
But hold that thought, because we're going to come back to that. What about this? Is this humorous? Hold that thought. This led to a long Facebook disagreement, whereas one of my friends who posted it um, thought it funny, and then somebody said, that's racist, and then they, they asked me, what do you think? I'm like, I haven't done this grant yet. I don't know. I said, well, yes and no. I think it depends on who's watching it, right? I think it depends on who's watching it. Um, so because the problem is we keep going. Right? I want you to just follow this for a moment. So, this is just Google, baggy pants. Googling baggy pants, this is what you get. And look at what you get when the person depicted is white. In one instance, in these instances, you get body deformity. And my concern is that that's linked to something bigger. And in this instance, you know, the body's not deformed, and here we go again, right? So I don't want to say that it's connected, but I think we have to keep in mind that certain bodies have been ridiculed and stereotyped such that the tendency to continue that might reflect a past misrepresentation, and that might not exist for other bodies. And see, I could use something like that in class to get students to think about a first image that they thought, oh, nothing. And I hate it because the friend that asked me, I could see, I thought it was funny when I first saw it. But then he asked me as a professor, thinking critically about this, and I had to say, well, so. All right, so now let's get to the broader literature review, that middle part of the cone. And we're narrowing down to the bottom where I say a little more about this hoped-for project. All right, so here is where my PowerPoint could be a lot more narrowed down because I really believe in PowerPoint and not Power Paragraph. Well, I'm sorry, I'm going to apologize now for some of the Power Paragraph that's going to go on. Okay, so dating back to colonization, ethnic humor is a process of immigrants' cultural adaptation based on power differentials shifting back and forth as either private or in-group communications or out-group exploitation, both of which result and reinforcement of ethnic self-identity. So you get stereotype reification when humor is ethnically focused. Sometimes the reification comes from outside and that a group is being demeaned, but sometimes they themselves will also play with the stereotypes, but that can also have the reinforcement impact. Ethnic minorities perform demeaning stereotypical depictions of their ascribed status for majority white audiences, that's been a problem, for example, um, with minstrelsy, blackface minstrelsy. When that initially happens, I think it starts in the late 1800s. I'm a horrible historian. Got any historians in the room? But anyway, it continues into the, early, um, the late 1800s, early 1900s, and some of the first black actors now have to put blackface on themselves, right? And so you get a horrible reification of a stereotype because it was started in a time where the people doing it were doing it to dehumanize, caricature, and misrepresent. So the, the process, this process began, for example, in terms of um, ethnic humor, of the, those who themselves are ethnic, with Jewish humor and eventually was carried out in black humor. So, um, but again, you get, to some extent, you get the ownership of the stereotypes, but you, because the broader context is still highly problematic, you end up reifying things instead of challenging them. And e even authentic, authentic performances of culturally intimate, intimate humor by famous comedians of color like Richard Pryor, for those of you who don't know Pryor, I could say Dave Chappelle, um, Done just to be funny can have a serious consequence. Joke about the ethnic groups can reduce cultures to the trivial, to be laughed at, and not something to be valued. So, how many of you even know who Richard Pryor is? Wow, I'm, 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 wow, I'm impressed. But Dave Chappelle? Okay, I'm going to talk more about him in a moment. Also, so humor has this usage when we're talking about ethnic minorities, but also other groups, women, for example. It has this usage of all too often reifying or reinforcing stereotypes. 
But then the other thing to consider that I found in the liter literature is that context matters. So humor is an important communicative aspect of our social relationships and interactions, which is contextually dependent and should not be reduced to trivial interpretations or viewed as inc inconsequential, as humor functions to reaffirm and maintain normative social boundaries. So we always have to think about the contexts in which humor is occurring. Um, and in our multicultural, globalized society, humor is incredibly ambiguous, and the context in which jokes are developed shapes their meaning. It is important to emphasize that to acknowledge the rhetorical structure of jokes, to see that they are created with communicative devices that can convey ideology, that they can do more than simply promote innocent laughter, is to acknowledge that jokes are something not simply just jokes. So sometimes you'll tell a joke and somebody's offended by it and they'll say, you'll say, I'm just kidding. Well, maybe as an individual you were just kidding, but given that broader context, you didn't intend for your joke to have the impact that it had, but given that broader historical context, it may have ended up, ended up laying on someone's ears in a way that they felt demeaning, because context matters. And humor does not exist in the back vacuum. That's the important thing to take away, that humor reifies normative hegemonic boundaries where jokes are both communicative, shaping devices, and instruments of meaning making. Okay, and resistance. So in the United States, ethnic jokes have often allowed white joke tellers to feel superior to disadvantaged ethnic racial minorities. That's one of the things we found in looking at the literature. However, media outlets such as the boondocks, y'all favor with familiar with the boondocks, okay, are significant to the meanings of daily lived experience because, experiences because the parodies reveal real struggles with contested meanings. So you're kind of disrupting that hegemonic narrative. Humor involving reverse discourses are a form of resistance to dominant power structures that combat racist truth claims. This is what some of the resistance literature says. For example, in The Chappelle Show, Dave Chappelle plays on and with stereotypes in order to remove stereotypical attitudes from the shadows of hidden attitudes to the spotlight, thereby placing stereotypes in the collective face of the viewers. Chappelle's performances are often counter-hegemonic to basic American cultural sensibilities and ideologies of race. Okay. But I, and I wish that this were, like, as promising as that looks, but is the, Ch the, the Chappelle show still on? Okay, we'll come to that in a moment, say what happened. All right, so now we're getting down to the bottom of the cone so I can talk about this hoped for project. So let me say a bit about lessons learned, and then we're going to get to hopefully being able to show some videos so I can ask you what you think. Um, all right, when politicians, celebrities, lawyers, professors, and other elite professions, did you know we have professors in the room, we're elite professions? Students, you should think about becoming professors because we're elite professions. Um, but we wouldn't get half the work done if it weren't for the staff, the support staff, the executive secretaries, and so we have to always appreciate, yo, I'm serious, I'm serious, and I think professors all too often don't pay enough attention to that. But when politicians, celebrities, lawyers, professors, and other elite professions are not members of vulnerable groups, jokes stick to the individual instead of the group. And the same is generally true of representatives of dominant groups. Right? So the joke would more likely stick to the individual, and that could be a problem. Um, but what happens when an individual politician, celebrity, or representative of a dominant group is the butt of a joke, especially the rise of humor? There may be a change in how seriously an individual is taken, unless it's Donald Trump and you're talking about the Nebraska, because it hasn't had an impact at all. That's kind of, well, that's a whole other lecture. Um, a negative trait or idea may be attack, attached to the individual via comic association. So I probably would use the following slide as a springboard to a discussion about rape culture. I may do so in about, I'm actually thinking of doing this in a couple of weeks, but I'm thinking of doing it with one of my upper level courses, um, 300 level sociological theory course. So I may use this. 
because I think they're at a point where they can, we can talk about it, and we can talk about it, its impact, and um, I don't know if I would use it with a 100 level course yet. I don't know, you know. Um, but uh, it's the criticism wouldn't stick to white men in general. It would stick to Donald Trump in particular. And in some places, it doesn't even have an impact. <laughs> okay, but we need to really proceed with caution when it's women, ethnic minorities, immigrants, sexual minorities, persons from low-income backgrounds. When, they're, when um, our members are vulnerable groups, right, because you could, and when you look at intersectionally at these, you might have one of these identities, but you may have um, dominant other identities, right? But when you get multiple vulnerable identities, it becomes really problematic. So if you are black and female and lesbian or something like that, you know, so that's the intersectional aspect. Um, when a member of a vulnerable group is the butt of a joke, especially the rise of humor, that adds to a socio-historical trend of not taking the group seriously. Hence that picture that I showed earlier. That's why I said yes and no about the baggy pants, because there's a whole history of misrepresenting black bodies. Um, and the negative trait or idea may be reattached to or reified for the entire group via comic association, not just the individual. So if I use the following as a springboard to discussion, I would also show the other baggy pants images to reveal the trend, as well as spend a lot of time talking about the racist precedents to which this image, image could be linked. So that's what I showed before. So I might use this, but I wouldn't just use this. I would want to make sure that students came around from looking at that in a very critical way. And then this is unfortunately, I mean, I'm unfortunate, I've been told, I don't know how many times, how many other sociologists we get in the, we just like mess up things, go to movies, people trying to laugh, and we're like, but did you know? So, but at least in the classroom, I don't feel so bad about doing that. You know, I really want my students to be critical thinkers, and they can both laugh. I mean, you can both say what I said. Yeah, that's funny, but depends on who's watching, depends on if they realize that this is our, um, meant to just be funny, it's, if, if they already have had wide exposures to misrepresentations of the bodies of the people being targeted, then this can be more problematic. So um, Christine Clark, a graduate of UMass Amherst, um, and on one of the other people working on this grant, she points out the following in regard to lessons learned in regard to intent versus impact. So when you say to someone, I was just kidding, you're speaking to your intent because you realize that something maybe had an impact you didn't mean. And so she says that racialized satire with a politically impressive intent may have the unintended impact of reinforcing instead of interrupting various forms of racism. A satirist cannot be sure if people are laughing at the satire on racism or at the racism. And in using comedy to raise critical consciousness, we must do our best to align intent and impact. Okay, so I don't know, I don't, let me see, I'll just give it away here, maybe I'll say it again. I can't remember if I talk about Dave Chappelle later or now, but his racial pixie, he had this racial pixie skit um, where he was on the airplane and you got the pixies, like he's making this order and the pixie is telling him to order fried chicken order fried chicken, he's like, it's like, a, you know, you got like the angel and the devil on each shoulder, and he was doing that to be, that's ridiculous, right? He's, but apparently he realized that people were laughing at the racism and not at the satire, and it was brought to his attention. Here he is being the satirist many times. Sometimes he could be more careful, I would say. How many of you are familiar with Clayton Bigswell? Bigsby, is that his name? Bigsby, Bigswell? The blind black supremacist, you know, so he's black, but he's a white supremacist, KKK, born blind, um, didn't realize he was black, and at the school for the blind where he um, grew up, they didn't tell him, so he ends up becoming the leader of, a KKK, of the KKK, a prominent leader, uh, and it's hilarious, I think it's hilarious, you know, it's such a, a critique, but apparently people could miss that, they could miss his satire and laugh at the racism, right? 
So that's why I don't want to assume that using comedy for critical consciousness raising just works the way we think it does. When I, when I use comedy clips, I can talk with students, we can discuss it, we can go back and forth, we can criticize it, they can get upset with me for being a buzzkill, you know, and, but we talk about it, and that's very different from not having that type of discussion. Okay, so how many of you uh, are familiar with Charlie Hebdo? Did you know about the Elan Kurdi photo? Okay, well, I'm, I apologize ahead of time because this is hard to see, and even harder to see if you ask me what Charlie Hebdo did. So he's a three-year-old Syrian who w washed ashore dead. Um, it's a very sad and powerful picture. And Charlie Hebdo did this. What will happen to little Elan when he becomes big? He's going to be um, the chaser of German women? So, I mean, he's three years old. And Ebdo, the claim is that they did this to raise consciousness about anti-immigrant sentiments. But I think they really don't get intent versus impact, if that's true. Right? And here's another. Um, the proof that Europe is Christian. Christians can walk on water. Muslim children flow. So close, to the, so close to the goal. And then there's a McDonald's menu for um, two kids' meals, Happy Meals, for the price of one. So, of course, there was widespread outrage over these images. Charlie Hebdo is a well-known, I mean, it's a premier weekly satirical magazine. And I think maybe it was the intent, I definitely hope it was the intent, to raise um, awareness, but I, the impact, according to people's responses, was something very different. So I don't know that I would use this, but to teach what went wrong, what obviously went wrong. And here you have someone who's a child and a member of a vulnerable group, refugees. And so the statement has the impact of not just being about the child, but about the group from which he comes, right? So you have to proceed with great caution when using comedy, um, and you have to always keep in mind intent versus impact. So let me see. I hope this works. I hope we get to watch a few clips, because, um, and I don't have anything as problematic as um, the Charlie Hebdo Elan Kurdi image. But I'd like now, I would like to now know, have you imagine that you're in class and we're talking about comedy and um, raising consciousness and um, critical perspective and um, whether a comedy is useful. So this next clip I have used to talk about Swedes versus Americans. Swedes versus Americans, right? So let's see, hopefully this works. You know Kevin Hart, right? So Swedes are known, are supposedly, the generalization is that they're conflict avoidant. That's a generalization, so. Okay, okay Kevin, today is the day we call Fiatista here in Sweden. Do, do you know what Fiatista is? Fiatista. Fiatista, yeah. Fiatista. Yeah, Fiatista. 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 Fiat, Fiatista. Okay. I don't know. Yes. The thing that is special with this day called Fiatista is that you get to treat yourself with this thing called semla. Semla. It's like, it's like bread with, with cream in the middle. It's a reverse donut. <laughs> really good. But you can only eat it today. Well, tomorrow. What if you want one tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> no, that is not socially accepted here in Sweden. Here in Sweden, you can only treat yourself once every year, and it's today. You can only eat what you want on one day, is what you're saying. That's stupid. No, 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 stupid. That keeps you fit. It created this perfect body. You say fit for a I'm fit too, but in America I can eat what I want. You, you were lucky. You were lucky. I don't know about you that. Don't have to do. Excuse me, hey. Excuse me. No, 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 no. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Keep, keep, keep. Keep, keep, keep. Keep, keep, keep. Keep, keep, keep. Keep, keep, Hey, calm down, calm down. You don't see a fucking line right here? Calm down, calm down. We don't do this. Okay, so the black guy here ain't a lie. It's not a lie when the black guy here. Calm down. Calm down. I'm also really, really annoyed. 
but in Sweden we have to keep the egg inside, we keep the egg inside, and then we go home, and then we punch a pillow, punch a pillow. That's how we do it. That's the Swedish way. You punch a pillow. I punched a pillow two times in my life. Let me get this straight, just so I understand what what Sweden is like. You get to eat what you want one day out of the year. Yes. Yeah. Right. Okay. You can't be angry. If you are angry, you gotta keep that anger inside your stomach. You gotta go home. You gotta, you gotta punch a pillow or take a shit. What, what'd you punch say? a pillow, maybe. Maybe. So people don't get mad at you. Yes. No, yeah. Yes. Inside of your mad. Excuse me. No, 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 no. Don't, 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 no, I got three of them. No, no, no. Don't, don't. I got three of them. I'm gonna waste them. One. Having two. Having here. Trick you. Put it on the glass. Having. You're making a scene. That make you mad? No. That piss you off? I am cool. Put it me. Kevin! Stop it! You no. told me people don't get mad. No, at I'm me. not mad. You know what? Since people don't get mad, ain't no need for me waiting for one of these. It's the Yates to die. It's the Yates to die. No, no, no. No, you need no, one no, too. That make you mad? No, that don't. That make, make you mad? mad? No. Huh? Why don't you just go home and punch a fucking pillow? No, I'm gonna yeah. punch Well, you do it. Hard. I'm gonna take these. I'm gonna eat this reverse donut. It's a fucking donut. No, it's not. That's all it is. No. Come, come back here. Come. Whoa, that one. Till sketch slut. And I sketch a voice samarbete med United International. Okay, so, reactions. I think it's funny. <laughs> okay. And someone from Sweden thinks it's funny. <coughs> and do you think it could work? Because then I use this as a springboard to talk about how Americans are perceived abroad. That was where I was going with this. And so I find that to just talk about how Americans are perceived abroad and to give studies about the ugly American students get, they take offense, they can take offense of that if the students themselves are mostly American. But to start out with something like this, usually people laugh and then we have a great conversation, right? Because it's, it's a, in many ways a gross misrepresentation of, of someone who's representing Sweden. Um, but when you come from the dominant group, these misrepresentations don't have the same impact, right? So the intent was that it would be funny, and the impact is that it's funny. Would you agree? Should we, what, how should we think critically about this? Should there be a critical way to think about that? All right, maybe I'll, so I'll keep going and, hey, what happened? Oh. All right, so here is another one. This one is longer. It's Swedish with subtitles. Um, and there's a lot going on here. And I have used this in my classes. Again, in Introduction to Sociology and talking about symbolic interactionism, I find it useful to have students watch first the version that's in all Swedish to see what they pick up just in terms of symbolic interactionism. And then what they miss because they don't understand. It's a real fun language because almost nobody speaks it. You can really like use it. I get telemarketing calls and I go, hey, y'all get to Lordy, what did you do? What did you do? And the people on the other end are going like, huh? Sprechen Sie Deutsch? Parlez-vous Francais? But I'm going to end up like with somebody who actually understands Swedish and I'm going to hang up real quick. But. But you can use it to teach about symbolic interactionism because even if you don't understand the language, you can pick up on other things. But then it gets to a point where when we talk about dominant group representatives, so in this particular clip you're going to see um, dominant group represents, representation. Um, one of them that I think is really funny, but I don't know if my Danish friends appreciate this. I've heard I have all of these Swedish um, stereotypes of Danes but the Swedish stereotypes of Danes are much like American stereotypes of Canadians, right? <laughs> but that Danish is a throat disease, right? I've heard that. Have you heard that? Stellan. Yeah. So, you know, and so there's a, there's a part in this where somebody is like coughing and a Dane thinks they're making fun of them. 
So I have to tell you, when I saw that, I hit the floor. I thought that was so funny. But let me, so let me show this, and we'll talk about it in a moment. It's meant to be, I think, satire, satirical, a critique of racism. Som hade kissat ner hela toalettringen. Det var så jävla trevligt att torka rent när man skulle sätta sig. Det har varit skitigt här. Kissat. Jag tycker det är skönt att sitta bara. Men man, man kan slappna av på ett annat sätt. Vad fan, man kan inte säga någonting utan att bli misstolkad för tiden. Så ska vi verkligen göra det här. Jag tycker det känns så jävla märkligt. Självklart ska vi göra det här. Lisa sa att hon var skitsnygg. Vi går ingenstans. Du har lite nya. Åh, <laughs> oh, för fan vad den här var äcklig. Bakar vi... Ursäkta? Du? Sk skulle jag kunna få byta den här? Den var skittorn. Den var negerboll istället. Så behöver vi inte säga negerboll, herregud? Vadå? Negerboll heter ju så. Det är ju kränka mörkhyar, herregud. Kan jag säga chokladmål istället som alla andra gör? Du, jag är fan inte rasist om det är det du sitter och säger. Du, förresten. Förresten, är det mer rasistiskt att säga chokladmål? Det kan vara mer rasistiskt att säga chokladmål än negerbål. Det ska jag förklara för dig här och nu. Mm -hmm. Därför att neder, förr i tiden när de bodde i djungeln, spelade fotboll med kokosnötter. Då hette det negerbål. Sen kom de vita. Snodde i det och döpte om det till fotboll och tog all cred. Jävligt rasistiskt. Ja, det var en polare som hade sett det på Discovery. Alltså det var ju typ Hitler och så här Goebbels och det gänget som döpte om det till fotboll och klavboll. Har du hört det? Eller vad? Alltså, jo. Jo, för fan. Det är absolut klart. Fan, vilken jävla tid hon tar på sig alltså. Du, jag drar och kollar vad som händer bara. Jag kommer snart. Eh, är det ni som är Lisas kompisar? Yes, ja, absolut. Det är vi som är fan och Johanna. Okej, okay, uh, alltså Jonta, när jag väger och köper en ne ne uh, alltså en fika, men här står ju ner. Ja, ah, hur känner ni Lisa då? Vi är som var klass på gymnasiet. Jaha, ah, musikalen din då? Ja, ah, precis. Okay. Alltså det var så himla kul när Lisa föreslog den här träffade mer. Kommer du ihåg? Hon var så liksom att... Titta också! Killen i klassen vägrar ge mig en negerboll och jävla bonkaka i så här. Jaha, alltså det här är fan nu Johanna, du vet, Lisa ska vi säga. Hej! Hej! <laughs> vad fan vad kul att du är här. Eller att du är... Eh, vi pratar precis om negerbollens historia. Ursäkta? Ja, det är med att det är så här skitmånga som har en smyg rasistisk syn på... Eh, vad heter det? Eh, neger. Mörkhyad. Ja, precis. <laughs> Ja, men det känns som om alla bara tävlar om att bli den nya hitten, bara äh! Alltså det är ju liksom, ni är ju precis som vi. Det är liksom ingen skillnad egentligen. Alltså, ni är inte så här farliga och vilda och bara bor i djungeln. <laughs> inte längre i alla fall. Det är mer turkar och araber som är farliga nu. Eller alltså vilda. Men när de typ spränger saker och så här. Typ som World Trade Center, för fan. Ja, men judarna då? De är ännu värre. Det ska ju vara så himla synd om dem hela tiden. Boo alla förföljer oss och vi har ingen land. Sånt jävla gnäll. Så min pappa är fan jude. Alltså vi kanske skulle ta och beställa. Är det någon som har någonting? Latte kan jag ta. Jag har med. Två lattar. Ursäkta, jag kallar dost precis för blatt. Nej, jag vet inte. Alltså sa han inte det? Nej, mamma, vad fan gör du? 
Vad jävla Sven kom hit för fan! Men jag har väl rätt i min åsikt om inte jag tycker om judar, eller hur? Ja, visst, absolut. Men du är för fan rasist! Rasist? Det är du som är rasist! Negerboll och negerboll! Och det är inte rasistiskt att säga negerboll. Det är för fan samma sak som att säga gul lök, eller vit lök, eller turkisk peppar. Vad säger du? Vad säger du, turkläppar? Vad säger du, turkläppar till mig? Va? Nej, det har jag inte gjort. Du är en rasist. Jag är fan inte rasist. Vad säger det här jag sa turkläppar till? Vad ska ni gå? Rattar du på färdig? Vad säger du? Här skriver du min mamma på mitt bok på helvete, gul fool. Du vet inte vad du talar om, du är lilla. Vad fan snackar du om, man? Jul! Gud! 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 Ja! Discomfort. Yeah, yeah. Miscommunication. Um, stereotyping, right? I mean, some blatant stereotyping. also it's a teachable moment because I don't like that they kind of put all racisms on an equal plane. I have, I have real problems at the end, although I still use this because I, I get what's going on. I mean, you, do, you should get that as a satire, right, at the very least, right? But the, at the end, to have the Native American pop up, and this is made in the 21st century, and the Native American or the uh, original um, First Nation or original nations person is dressed as if he's from the 1800s. And I think that's really problematic because there is a group that is so often misrepresented, that is so numerically small, um, that doesn't have the power to fight back. And so the intent and the impact are out of kilter, if you ask me, for that moment, right? And we have a Dakota Access Pipeline going on right now, and it's largely out of the news. Um, it's been better covered in some instances by foreign news outlets. Um, but, it, I mean, it has, it has gotten some American news coverage. But we could go on, I mean, I think to just show that clip and not talk about it, might be problematic, but to show it and talk about it, you know, it, it, it gets some really good discussions going on. And then I can, I never have the same conversation twice because students will always bring something to it that I maybe hadn't considered, right? But it can lead to a really thoughtful discussion about misunderstanding, uh, um, being embedded in racism, racist language, um, which groups are harmed, like I don't, I don't think that, are Danes harmed by the misrepresentation of their, their language being a throat disease? Not so much, you know. But then again, but you don't have, um, and there may be, so you have a dominant group that's not harmed to the same extent as the Native American is harmed by that rep misrepresentation of who they are. So that's another thing we can talk about when I show this clip. All right, I think I have time for one more. Uh-oh, sorry. Okay. 
Okay, so, how many of you have seen this? All right. Don't know if I'm going to use it. If I use it, I would use it in my upper level class. Don't know if I would use it in my 100 level class. Um, I did use it last year in a 400 level class. Um, and we had a rich discussion about this particular video, especially against the backdrop of the Black Lives Matter movement. Right? So there are multiple things. I'll tell you ahead of time. There are multiple things going on. If I'm sitting in the room with mostly other African Americans, I think this is funny. I think it's hilarious. Or if I'm sitting in a room with people who get um, that this is a comedic performance, I think it's funny. But then when I worry that people they take seriously that the problem with black people being shot and having two times, 2.5 times the rate of police killings as whites, it's even higher for Native Americans, that they could, this could boil it down to, well, if they just behave the right way. Right? So I just want to let you know I'm, I'm a multiple lines about minds about this. Um, and this is, this is, again, where context matters. So in the black community, myself, often worry that we might be a victim of police brutality. And one of the African-American students in my class said, sometimes you just got to laugh at this stuff, right? So that's also a pot uh, potential response, to take the sting out of it in, to some extent. So, as a public service, the Chris Rock Show proudly presents this educational video. <laughs> Have you ever been face to face with a police officer and wondered, is he about to kick my ass? <laughs> well, wonder no more. If you follow these easy tips, you'll be fine. First, Obey the law. Laws were made for a reason. Think of them as hints. You heard people say, man, I wouldn't do that shit if I was you. Well, here's some of that shit. Carjacking, armed robbery, arson, selling drugs, buying drugs, stabbing, shooting. You know, you probably won't get your ass kicked if you just use common sense. If you jump a subway turnstile, you might just get off with a warning from the police. But if you jump a turnstile carrying a loaded gun and smoking a joint, then maybe you need your ass kicked. We all know what happened to Rodney King. But Rodney wouldn't have gotten his ass kicked if he had just followed this simple tip. When you see flashing police lights in your mirror, stop immediately. Everybody knows, if the police have to come and get you, they're bringing an ass kicking with you. Here's a no brainer. If you're listening to loud rap music, turn that shit off. Blast and fuck the police while you're getting pulled over by the police. It's just ignorant. When an officer approaches your car, be polite. Is there a problem, officer? And stay in your car with your hands on the wheel. What the fuck do you want, motherfucker? <laughs> Wanna give a friend a ride? Not so fast. Your friend might be crazy. Now before you let your friend in your car, ask him these questions. Do you have a gun? Do you have drugs? Do you have any warrants? And in case you do get pulled over by the cops. License and registration, please. Remind your friend to do this one thing. Shut the fuck up. Hey, don't give him shit. What the fuck do you want? to be the difference between a ticket and a bullet in the ass. Here's a tip you should never forget. If your woman is mad at you, leave her at home. Because a mad woman will say anything. He got weed! He got weed! If your woman is mad at you, 
There's nothing she'd like to see more than you getting your ass kicked. Now, what you do? Obey the law. Use common sense. Stop immediately. Turn that shit off. Be polite. Shut the fuck up. Get a white friend. And last but not least, don't ride with a mad woman. If you follow these simple pointers, you probably won't get your ass kicked by the police. Okay, quick reactions. <laughs> It's funny, right? But do you see how it could be tricky to use at the same time? Right. Right. A, who's in the audience? And I think to use this would be, it would at least get people laughing, but then to lead to a more serious discussion, to maybe dispel some of the things, you know. It, of course, it is common sense that the things that you shouldn't do if you don't want to um, get the police angry with you. But to also show the instances when people um, had police assaults or were um, negative encounters, when they did do everything right. You would want to dispel that myth. But you can see how the audience watching this um, would play a big role in um, how innocent the laughing was. Yes, Stellan. Right, and I think that I think that probably the people in this room get that, the the absurdity, and the, and but then it's like the potential for people to say, see, even Chris Rock says that if you just obeyed the law, you know, you wouldn't get. And so that's the challenge. That's why when I'm saying that I'm I use comedy, I want you to know that I do so very thoughtfully, very carefully, very much in conversation with the, with the with the students. Yes. So you don't see it as satirical, no. right? Okay. Being serious. Other reactions. I mean, there are multiple ways to read this. That's the thing. That's that's what I want. That's the point I want to make about this particular clip. Yes. Okay, so this next clip, um, I have a, a multicultural expert colleague. He teaches high school. He's a multicultural instructor, um, white male, Nebraskan, who teaches white privilege in my classes. And I find that it's in many ways easier for him, not just because he's white and male, but because he's Nebraskan. So he comes up with these concrete examples that students, um, it's hard to deny, right? I'm trying to get him to understand because my one critique of his presentation is he equates, he doesn't, he kind of thinks of white privilege as equally available to all whites. And I think um, the skin color privilege, we often will say things like, well, if they're from Appalachia, but, but they put on a suit and hail a taxi in New York City, they get that taxi. That's true. Probably I'd be standing there and the taxi would go right by me, but how many people who are really poor in Appalachia get a suit and stand in New York City to get a taxi? So I think it's also important to recognize 
um, the limits of white privilege. Now, however, if you compare people, whites in Appalachia, to blacks in Appalachia, to Native Americans in Appalachia, then you can start to see how privilege can function. So I think that there's, but, but he does his general presentation, and he uses Louis C.K. to start out the discussion. Sorry I'm being so negative. I guess I'm a bummer. I don't know. I, I shouldn't be. I'm a very, uh, you know, lucky guy. I got a lot going for me. I'm, I'm healthy. I'm relatively young. I'm white, which thank God for that shit, boy. That is a huge leg up. Are you kidding me? Oh, God, I love being white. I really do. Seriously, if you're not white, you're missing out because this shit is thoroughly good. It, and, but let me be clear, by the way. I'm not saying that white people are better. I'm saying that being white is clearly better. Who could even argue? <laughs> if it was an option, I would re-up every year. Oh, yeah, I'll take white again. Absolutely. I'm gonna, <laughs> enjoying that. I'm going to stick with white. Thank you. Here's how great it is to be white. I could get in a time machine and go to any time, and it would be fucking awesome when I get there. exclusively a white privilege. Black people can't fuck with time machines. A black guy in a time machine is like, hey, before 1980, no thank you, I don't want to go. <laughs> but I can go to any time. The year two? I don't even know what was happening then. But I know when I get there, welcome, we have a table right here for you, sir. <laughs> thank you. Oh, it's lovely here in the year two. I can go to any time. In the past, I don't want to go to the future and find out what happens to white people because we're going to pay hard for this shit. You got to know that. They're not going to just fall from number one to two. They're going to hold us down and fuck us in the ass forever. And we totally deserve it. But for now, we... Now, if you're, if you're white and you don't admit that it's great, you're an asshole. It is great. And I'm a man. How many advantages could one person have? I'm a white man. You, you can't even hurt my feelings. <laughs> what can you really call a white man that really digs deep? Hey, cracker. Oh, ruin my day. <laughs> Boy, shouldn't have called me a cracker. I'm bringing me back to owning land and people. What a drag. Sorry I'm being so negative. Sorry. Okay, so I think it's more obvious why that... Hey. Oh, sorry. Sorry I'm being so negative. Okay, so I think it's more obvious why that is a great springboard for a discussion about white privilege. Right? Other reactions to it? <laughs> yes, sir. The initial divide and conquer in the colonies. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so um, this this and so I guess you could it's ex excellent point. And so he, but here's an an example of how we how I use comedy to talk about these difficult topics, to just go in and talk about the naturalization naturalization act of 1790 or the point in the colonies in the late 1600s where initially enslaved people or indentured servants were European. They were poor. They were African. Um, there were blacks that actually owned, or we would call them blacks now. We wouldn't have called them that then because that term didn't operate the way it operates now. There were African origin people who owned slaves. Um, 
Um, there were Irish and other poor folk from England who were indentured servants. Um, and you see as we move to the late 1600s, in Virginia, my home state, I'm from Virginia, I'm always, I'm from Virginia, yeah, loving, the movie Loving is coming out about the um, Supreme Court case of the couple that, yeah, I, I'm like, but, um, and so in the late, as you get to the end of the 1600s, you see this concept, white people, that didn't exist before, right? Um, and it, it happens in the wake of, like, these rebellions, like one of them was Bacon's Rebellion, where all the people who weren't extremely wealthy landowners, so even the kind of the more middle to lower income la white landowners got together with indentured servants and opened up a can of whoop ass on Jamestown and the governor ran away and the, the power elites in Virginia and the colonies were like, whoa, they're more numerous than us. And you start to see the passage of these laws and these rules that then give poor white people the right to oversee. They make blacks or African origin people slaves for life. They give poor white people the right to oversee blacks. And so that's what he's referring to. But you can have that type of conversation now because we've kind of gotten people to think about white privilege in a way that makes, that relaxes people to some extent. Okay, so if Bill Gates or Warren Buffett lavishly funded our project, um, we would first have to come up with a research question, right? And so far it looks like this. I mentioned something like this earlier. Under what circumstances does humor lead to a reading of the world that can make us more reflexive about social injustices? And then you have to think about the flip side of that too, when it doesn't work. But more specifically, what mixture of best practices and crucial cautions should we keep in mind in using humor as a springboard to discussion about social inequities and social injustices? And I said some of them, but I, want to I would like that we study this and have more kind of empirically based claims, because what I have now are anecdotes. What if any types of humor should be off limits? Or you would have to use with extreme caution. I think this could also help comedians who intend for their work to be satirical, who intend that people laugh at the satire and not the racism or not the sexism or not the um, homophobia or not the anti-Semitism, whatever it is, that they, they really intend for their satire to be the, the most powerful aspect of their comedic performance. So what kind of information could we provide for them to more than not, make sure that happens. Um, and then what mixture of qualitative methods would best help us answer these types of research questions? You know, I think if Bill or um, Melinda or Gates or Warren Buffett, we're going to have to apply to like the National Science Foundation, the National Institutes of Health. I don't think, I'll see if I know somebody who knows somebody who knows Warren Buffett, but I think we're going to have to go through the regular route to get the funding for this. But I just think that this, this is where we are in this project, at this point of trying to figure out what the research question is, how to turn something that's been done anecdotally into something that's studied systematically. And so here's the joke in progress. Remember, I lack a sense of humor, but I, I'm open to suggestions. So we got the educator, the activist, and the sociologist walking into a bar. They sit, they get their drinks, and begin to toast. The educator raises a glass and toasts to education, the great equalizer. The activist joins in and toasts to social justice. None of us are free until all of us are free. Um, the sociologist raises a glass, frowns, put the glass down, and says, I tried this with Stellan, and you know he was like, no, nah, I keep working on it. <laughs> you know that toasts are not statistically significant, or a toast is just a social construct. My mom fell asleep on that one. And then somebody said, maybe out of the choices that I have so far, the one that people would maybe get the best would be something like, statistically speaking, any joke that begins with an educator, activist, and a sociologist cannot be funny. <laughs> <laughs> Because I kept trying to make it funny, and one of my friends was like, nah, it's not working. Hmm? 
Sometimes it's because it's corny. It works if you're a professor and it's not funny because your students are like, oh, the professor's trying to be funny. Oh, she's sweet. <laughs> but I think, you know, I just want to, you know, a sense of humor and the complexity of it. And so questions and recommendations. Thank you.